Good evening, viewers. Welcome to the special uh, teleconferencing. Uh, today we will be discussing a theme which is much debated in the political science and the social science uh, literature, which is civil society. Nobody actually knows what this particular term means, uh, or maybe people are still hazarding towards what it means. Uh, but in the classical tradition, we have had some thinkers who have eminently outlined what uh, the civil society is in their respective times, that is in the 18th and the 19th centuries. Uh, we come across Dominic Cola in the literature who says ki the civil society actually comes up as a result of the state's contest against this against against the church or against the fanaticism of religion uh, here civil society is seen as an aspect of uh, the state itself uh, uh, then as Neera Chandok has pointed out it was in the 18th century that uh, it was the it was the political economists who were trying to contest the power of the uh, mercantilist state that the concept of civil society was bandied about uh, the, uh, the the interplay between state and uh, state and civil society continues in the tradition of de Tocqueville, who links civil society uh, or existence of civil society to to the existence of a democratic state. He says in U.S. the civil society exists because a democratic state was liberal democratic state was in existence. Uh, similarly, in uh, in that, uh, similarly, we have had uh, people like John Locke, another classical uh, 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 classical thinker, who talked about emergence of civil society as a, as, a, as some kind of a contractual uh, mo uh, contractual move away from the state of nature to state of contract, where basically individuals contracted to form uh, 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 the form the civil society. In the Enlightenment thinkers' tradition of Hegel and so on, civil society is regarded as some kind of a mom was one of the moments in the ethical life of development of society, where it is placed between the, the family and the state. The Marxian tradition is much more explicit in this regard. The Marxists see the civil society as uh, the sphere where uh, uh, the interests of the bourgeoisie are, or in interests of the uh, in interests of the bourgeoisie, the bourgeoisie are protected. In fact, and uh, though this position has been refined in both in Marx's writings as well as later Marxists like Gramsci, uh, more or less the in the the argument of Marx is that it is a sphere in which the appropriation of surplus labor takes place. Uh, Gramsci is more refined in this aspect because he he sees. Uh, he, he sees civil society in terms of idea, in, in ide terms of ideas and ideological terms, where he says the civil society is the sphere in which the uh, hegemony or the man or the manufacturing of consent actually takes place. He, all these thinkers in the Marxian tradition again, the interrelation between state and civil society is again there. I mean, it's Gramsci is also seeing the state the state as playing a role. In, along with civil society in manufacturing consent for the dominant or the ruling class. Now, these traditions of thinking, we have, uh, uh, have, have, have given us some kind of an idea about what civil society is. Uh, we will be discussing on these aspects today. We, today we have with us two people from the school of uh, the School of Social Sciences from the Faculty of Political Science, Dr. Anurag Joshi 
and Dr. Vijay Shekhar Reddy, they will be giving us some kind of an out idea about what the features of the civil society are, what are the organizations and institutions active in the civil society. Uh, we will be talking about that. But uh, this being a special teleconferencing, let me also call upon all the regional centers and uh, who, whoever are people present there to please call in and tell us whether you are there or not. Uh, because we want to know how many of you are present and how many are actually effectively listening to this broadcast. I will be organizing this particular teleconferencing uh, in the following way. The, each speaker, uh, that is Dr. Joshi and Dr. Bidashekar Reddy, will get 15 minutes each to make their uh, presentations and then we will follow that up with a discussion. Over to Dr. Anurag Joshi. Well, <coughs> Thank you, Ajay. Uh, before I go on to details, um, I would like to welcome our viewers to this um, evening uh, teleconferencing session. Uh, I may point out that this uh, decision to have teleconferencing sessions in the evenings, that is a rather recent one and this has mainly come about to encourage a two-way response between those of us who are present in the EMPC studios at the IGNU headquarters and those of you present across the country in uh, various regional centers and or study centers. The idea is to encourage uh, interactions uh, between you and us and I hope that uh, you would take a due cognizance of this. Now having said this, uh, today's session is uh, devoted uh, to the bachelor's degree program that is BDP in which uh, IGNU has a considerable enrollment. Uh, the theme uh, that is civil society, uh, it figures there in uh, different courses of uh, political science as well as other disciplines. Of course, you know each discipline has its way of looking at it. Uh, since the session is devoted to the bachelor's degree program, uh, then I may mention that in our new course, in political theory uh, that is EPS 11. Earlier some of you uh, would be knowing that <coughs> uh, excuse me uh, we had EPS 01 so now we have EPS 11 uh, in which block number 3 that is understanding the state uh, unit number 13 uh, deals with civil society. And of course, as I mentioned, civil society is also covered at the master's level. For instance, in our uh, master's a program in political science, in course number one, which is a compulsory course, uh, that is MPS 001, going by the title of political theory, again in book one, our master's program, as you, some of you, could be knowing is in the forms of books, books 1 and 2. So there is a unit on civil society in book 1. Now uh, coming to the details, the nitty gritty as they say, uh, civil society is a term which has uh, come up in focus rather prominently in recent years. Uh, you, If you have, uh, are in the habit of reading newspapers, uh, especially editorials or uh, the lead articles in uh, magazines which are a bit serious magazines, not glossies, as well as if you uh, follow say uh, news and current affairs events in the electronic media, you will find that the term uh, civil society is used uh, rather frequently. It is not that it has not been uh, in focus earlier, but the focus is sharper now. And 
this is because of uh, events uh, on the world stage in the last 15 20 years uh, so, uh, for instance events such as the disintegration of the former Soviet Union of the former uh, East European bloc countries uh, which led to an erosion you know in the credibility of the state and the idea of civil society emerged as a phenomena that is and could be a parallel power of center that is uh, as a, a sort of alternative to the state uh, then also in the last two decades or so in India elsewhere in the world we have seen the rise of uh, various uh, grassroots movements, social movements that are aiming to bring about a uh, social transformation and when that is your concern then inevitably you get drawn into the questions uh, or issues of civil society, state, uh, society at large or community as some prefer to use that term and so on and so forth. Now, uh, in fact, uh, civil society as a concept, uh, as uh, my colleague Ajay pointed out, civil society and state are concepts which are inextricably linked together. Uh, and it is, I mean, you cannot really uh, compartmentalize the two or treat them as two uh, watertight compartments. When you are deliberating on one, uh, necessarily you deliberate on the other also, it's inevitable. And uh, so that is uh, one uh, crucial point that you have to keep in your mind. Now, uh, as uh, uh, Ajay pointed out, uh, I would also like to dwell on it a bit uh, in literature, in social science literature today uh, when we are studying political science as well as when you are into other disciplines, uh, state and civil society at a theoretical level as theoretical constructs are treated separately. They are distinct, but this was not always the case. In fact, uh, till uh, as it has already been pointed out, till uh, secul till the concept and practice of secularism got established, the st uh, state and civil society were looked upon as a sort of conjoint entities. The two terms were, in fact, used almost. Uh, interchangeably. When one talked of civil society, uh, one had uh, one referred to the state and vice versa. Now, uh, those of you who have also been uh, students of history, uh, you would recollect that there came a time in uh, Europe when <coughs> the monarchs, the kings, they began to increasingly resent uh, the authority of the church, especially uh, the authority of the Pope, who as you know is the head of the, uh, the Roman Catholic uh, community the world over. Uh, historically, it's so evolved that the authority of the church uh, began to transcend uh, the authority of the king or the monarch and there came a time when this was not appreciated. It was felt that the affairs of the state should be kept separate from the affairs of uh, the church or, one, or you can say that the political sphere or the matters of state craft governance should be separate from uh, the matters of uh, religion, uh, religiosity, spirituality, whatever term you may like to use. And this was the beginning of 
the coming into being of the concept of secularism and its subsequent practice now it when this happened it was from this time onwards that state and uh, like the name of uh, dominicola was mentioned so uh, I, uh, I, the, one can repeat uh, he pointed out that there was a point of time when the state was seen as a civil society civil society opposing the might of the church so it is with the coming into being of secularism as a concept and practice that the two began to be treated differently this is one uh, you can say a uh, defining moment <laughs> if i may use that term uh now of course um, as i said in practice uh, you all have you talked the of the two of them together but those of you who are students of political science or any other discipline at a theoretical level at the level of uh, intellectual construct it should be clear to you that the two are distinct terms it, you cannot like uh, use them interchangeably or loosely the layman may do it but uh, not those who are students and scholars uh, so this is one thing now uh, civil society uh, there are the ajay has pointed out there are different perspectives on it essentially <coughs> just to recapitulate there are basically four perspectives one is what is called the tocquevillian this takes after the famous french scholar alexi de tocqueville uh, then you have lockean they premised on the formulations of uh, uh, john lock you have the hegelian perspective which is based on the writings of the famous german philosopher uh, friedrich hegel and of course you have the marxian perspective in uh, where in as uh, are uh anchor and a colleague ajay pointed out you have the classical marxian perspective taking off from karl marx himself and variants of it basically based on the deliberations of uh, antonio gramsci uh it is uh, uh, not necessary really to go into details of these perspectives uh, at the moment uh, so that i will not do uh yes uh, anurag this karnar online yeah karnar please come up with your question yes karnar we are um, go, uh, good evening sir good uh, evening we are uh, uh, in fact uh, we uh, we would like to make to make, make a request to you yes. that is if we get the, the schedule and the uh, uh, details of the topics much in advance huh. uh, there uh, there could be a much more uh, fruitful interaction in, uh, in the uh, in the course of the program in fact uh, one of our students has a query hmm. and i will just uh, hand over the uh, mic to him yeah please thank you good evening sir yeah, good, good evening. evening good evening या गुड इवनिंग कम गो हेड विद योर क्वेश्चन अंतरराष्ट्रीय परिपक्ष में हां अंतरराष्ट्रीय संबंधों में संस्थाओं में हम बोलिए डब्ल्यूटीओ हम यूएन आदि के कार्य के सिविल सोसाइटी का कोई योगदान हो सकता है कैन डब्ल्यूटीओ एंड यूएनओ थैंक यू सर ओके थैंक यू can wto uno can can they can they contribute to the civil so civil society Ajay, you will like to say something see first of all we should be very clear <laughs> what exactly constitutes a civil society civil society basically as uh, the discussion uh, which has preceded me has pointed to you uh, pointed out that the meaning of civil society has changed across time depending on different uh, and even theoretical perspectives so at present uh, how do we conceptualize civil society we see civil society as a sphere of uh, social and uh, political activity which takes place outside the state and the market 
This is the basic definition yeah. of uh, civil society. So in this, the WTO and the United Nations do not necessarily come as a part of civil society because these are intergovernmental agencies, basically. That is, the, it is the states which have come together and set up these organizations. Yes, there are many non-governmental organizations in the international sphere which uh, are having international uh, I mean, reach. For instance, the Amnesty International. You can uh, include it as uh, one of the uh, members of the civil society, the international civil society. Yeah. But the United Nations strictly cannot be called as a, an organ of the international civil society. So can they contribute to the building of civil society? Yes. See, just as uh, the state has been a playing an important role in uh, uh, promoting civil society organizations within the, its own territory, so do international organizations have the capacity to uh, I mean, uh, promote uh, civil society organizations. Like for instance, not many would know that most of the non-governmental organizations, whether they are operating locally or operating internationally, are largely funded by the states. As of course, there is a a large contribution coming from charity and uh, non-profit uh, organizations, but the state is equally contributing to these uh, uh, non-governmental organizations with which the concept of civil society is so closely associated. But of course, uh, civil society encompasses not only non-governmental organizations which perform the advocacy role, but it includes a very num large number of interest groups uh, whether say trade unions, student union activities, the teachers and other professional organizations coming together. This apart, there are several other non-profit organizations which should be included in civil society. I think they have uh, somewhat clarified uh, the question. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, any more questions? Please uh, do come up with the questions. Meanwhile, we'll continue with our discussion. Anurag. Yeah, no, uh, I would... Uh, uh, Responding to the student, uh, I would say that between uh, the WTO and the UN, uh, the mandate of the UN, its agenda and its structuring is such that uh, UN can contribute, as my colleague uh, Dr. Vijay Shekhar Reddy pointed out, it can be conducive towards a strengthening of civil society. But uh, even if it is, as he said, it's an intergovernmental organization and strictly outside the fold, but as far as the WTO is concerned or the World Trade Organization, uh, as we all know, uh, WTO is uh, criticized for imposing the economic and other agendas of the advanced uh, capitalist West. So, how conducive it can be towards uh, uh, promotion of civil society, uh, I have my doubts and even if it were to be conducive, it would again be in the lines of uh, orienting civil society to move in a, a direction that it desires. So, that is how I would like to put it. Also, you must also remember uh, that, uh, that I mean, there are of course perspectives which argue that uh, there is a complementarity between uh, <coughs> state and civil society and so on. But, but also in the classical tradition, there is a perspective which argues that they are not necessarily complementary, the civil society and state. Uh, there, there, there are contradictions between them, and there are... Uh, uh, and, and basically, the, if you look at the movements of the 1980s, the civil society, the, the civil movements of the 1980s, they were actually directed towards uh, overthrowing, uh, you know, overthrowing state systems. I mean, they're in, they were in contradiction with uh, state systems. They overthrew a number of state, uh, state systems of the communist uh, Europe and so on and so forth. And uh, 
this basically comes from the fact that there is some kind of a uh, some kind of a movement within civil society to society to establish democratic spaces in a in a manner in which earlier social and e social economic and political inequalities are negated yeah uh, uh, i think it's uh, uh, very rightly pointed out by ajay and i had also mentioned this that the contemporary focus on civil society is to a great extent uh, traceable to the events on the world stage in the last two decades or so that is the breakdown of uh, the former Soviet Union which was supposed to be a totalitarian regime and it uh, satellites the former East European bloc countries. Civil society actually in the times that we are living the focus on civil society is because civil society you can say is the what is the dissenting voice against the might of the state and that is why it has become very prominent this is also a link to uh, the phenomenon as uh, which we uh, uh, keep reading about hearing about that is the phenomenon of globalization what has happened is that in the era of globalization uh, this may sound contradictory what has happened is that in the era of globalization the state is withdrawing from certain vital sectors and in such a situation then uh, you need like a, sp a space is there is a sort of vacuum and this vacuum then needs to be occupied by the civil society as I had said that one conception of civil society is also as a parallel center of power now when the state is supposed to be uh, withdrawing then you uh, need a, so, uh, one can say an entity or a phenomenon that channelizes the vibrant energies of the citizens so here also the focus on civil society is as a, one can say as an alternative to the state <coughs> one the the well known view of civil society is that uh, as i said civil it is it's a voice of dissent or it's a uh, channel of dissent against the state the other view uh, which you may find to a uh, bit difficult to comprehend at first go is that civil society is also uh, an alt an alternative mechanism to the state uh, where we are in the era of globalization when you find that the state is withdrawing from uh, withdrawing itself from various uh, sectors then uh, civil society tends to provide a focal point for the various uh, interests of the citizens to converge That's so here also the importance of civil society comes in though I would repeat that uh, the term civil society wherever it is mentioned uh, what comes immediately to mind is uh, the, the dissenting space but the other perspective also uh, the students can keep in mind Brother, you want to add something to this? Mm, I think broadly agree with uh, what uh, Anurag uh, uh, just uh, elaborated. I will just uh, add uh, one or two aspects to this. Mm. First is uh, the very fact that the withdrawal of the state <coughs> has led to the increasing uh, space uh, by the civil society organizations. That points to a very interesting uh, in, uh, aspects when we examine the history of uh, state and civil society relations over a period of time. The first time when civil society gets emphasized in uh, social and political literature is at a time when the state is uh, weak or withdrawing from the economic activity, when the demand was for a minimal state. Mm -hmm. That is what uh, John Locke was arguing for a minimal state, a state which would not be true intrusive in the uh, yeah. economy. And uh, what has happened is from the later half of the 19th century, 
The state intervention in society has increased. It assumed many functions and uh, by at the end of the First World War, it intervened so much uh, that uh, I mean, both uh, from the socialist uh, perspective as well as from the liberal perspective, the state intervention in social and economic sphere multiplied after the second wo First World War. With the result that, uh, I mean, for instance, the welfare state concept is a very good example which says uh, from cradle to grave, the state is uh, inter intervening in the affairs of all aspects of the society. That, uh, it is only in, again with uh, the liberalization and privatization gaining force in the 80s and 90s that uh, again the concept of civil society and pluralism have gained resurgence. Of course, it is uh, a time which coincided with uh, what my colleague has said, the uh, dissent against uh, strong totalitarian or uh, strong states in East Europe and later the establishment of uh, democratic institutions in uh, former Soviet Union. But uh, you should note that uh, similar developments, I mean these are not directed against only the, uh, the communist or the socialist states. Mm -hmm. Even in uh, other uh, areas like in Latin America, for instance, you will find in the late 80s and 90s strong uh, democratic movements emerged against uh, military dictatorships in Latin America. These also have uh, pushed the concept of civil society to the fore, say in the uh, uh, 90s and uh, onwards. No. Uh, uh, okay, this also brings me to the question as to the, uh, I mean, the there is also a distinction made, I mean, especially in the unit uh, which has been written by, uh, for the EPS 11, uh, there is a distinction made between community and civil society. Uh, we need to look into this also a little closely as to uh, how do, where do we draw the distinctions, I mean, in between the two. Uh, because inevitably, popular movements are movements which are, uh, which, which basically if you call them just civil society movements, that will be a misnomer. Popular movements draw upon a variety of resources. They draw upon various kinds of various kinds of primordial ties, other kind of uh, this. I mean, those, those cannot be negated in the coming up of a, of a civil society movement or, or, or in coming up of a popular movement. So, when in your unit you are making a distinct, distinction between civil society and community, what do you exactly mean? Uh, see, here broadly we have seen uh, community as the society. Hmm. Not all aspects of uh, society's life are or can be described as a civil society. Mm. There are only certain uh, features or uh, aspects of uh, society which can be truly described as active falling within the sphere of civil society. And what are these how, and how do we make a distinction between society or community and the civil society? Here one or two things uh, which have to be kept in mind is Civil society organizations, association and interest groups are uh, uncoercive and are organized to promote certain interests, a collective interest. They may be in small groups like a small uh, parent teachers uh, association meeting or it could be a, a, I mean a small uh, students union or uh, a teachers uh, association or any such a professional uh, organization, it is performing certain political role as well as an economic role. For instance, a trade union has a definite economic uh, role uh, to play, though it is a non-profit organization. Similarly, many other organizations which are there, which are often described as a non-profit and falling within the civil society, they perform a, uh, a distinct economic role though they are not part of the market. This is one uh, distinction that uh, one has to keep in mind uh, okay. in distinguishing between uh, a society and civil society. Okay. Uh, Rag, you want to add something to this? Yeah, um, actually Ajay uh, posed an interesting question. Uh, generally, uh, as I said in my presentation, uh, state, civil society and community uh, people often 
use the terms interchangeably loosely but uh, those who are students of political science or social science students uh, they should be clear in their minds that the terms are distinct now <clears throat> one way to understand is you do, is just uh, i'll put it this way if you have state on one side and civil society uh, and community on the other side then civil society is the space between these two okay. uh, since we have students of hindi also if i use the hindi equivalents uh, one they may understand i mean even those who are english speaking understand it better you see civil society is translated as nagrik samaj whereas community is translated as samudaya now just from the translations you can make out that they have to be different a, a nagrik samaj and a samudaya are not one and the same thing one i have told you is in terms of uh, sort of you can say spatial representation or a graphical representation if you keep the state on one side and uh, the community on the other a civil society comes in between okay <clears throat> secondly one way to distinguish between a community and a civil society is a community is largely governed by what are called primordial or non secular considerations such as say considerations of caste color creed race uh, place of birth language region etc but those who constitute a civil society they of course will be belonging to a caste will be belonging to a religion etc etc but they are guided or supposed to be guided by a uh, non primordial yeah okay come on okay come on come along and give us a question quick haan ji sir ye hai main ek sawal puchna chahta hu sir ha ye pressure group aur civil society ke beech kya sambandh hai dekhiye pressure, pressure group, group to civil society ke nirman mein kya yogdan dete hain देखिए प्रेशर ग्रुप तो सिविल सोसाइटी का ही हिस्सा हिस्सा हो गया इसी हिसाब समझ लीजिए प्रेशर ग्रुप या हित समूह जो आप हिंदी में बोलते हैं हित समूह नागरिक समाज का हिस्सा हुआ और प्रेशर ग्रुप अगर वाइब्रेंट है एक्टिव है पब्लिक एंड से ड्रिवेन है तो सिविल सोसाइटी और वाइब्रेंट होगी बट प्रेशर अगर आप अंग्रेजी में समझना चाहें तो प्रेशर ग्रुप इज सब्स्यूम्ड अंडर सिविल सोसाइटी civil society includes pressure group i hope that answers your question uh, uh, karnal so coming back to ajay what i was explaining yeah the distinction see uh, uh, one so this distinction is vital mm -hmm. that is a community or a samudaya is governed driven by primordial considerations or other you can say non secular civil society is driven by secular considerations you know it is it is not supposed to be guided by considerations of kith and kin etc etc second vital distinction is a community usually you has you know uh, private ends or particularistic ends okay a civil society by definition is driven by public ends or a public cause mm -hmm. a private cause is not a cause of a civil society it uh, it is it has to be a public cause okay. so uh, the distinctions are finer but as students one has to distinguish otherwise okay. so as i've said uh, terms are used interchangeably okay. but finer distinctions are also you know difficult to delineate hmm. but they are there okay one so i mean i mentioned two points one is primordial versus secular okay other is public versus private ends okay and in terms of if you want a representation that i have given if the state is on one side and community on the other then civil society falls in between these two okay thank you that is how one, one can distinguish uh, verification and that yeah. what happens if a civil society organization yeah is uh, taking a particular interest suppose there is a 
से एनी प्रोफेशनल ऑर्गेनाइजेशन है डॉक्टर्स एसोसिएशन और से ए टीचर्स एसोसिएशन और ए वर्कर्स यूनियन टेक्स ए नैरो इंटरेस्ट ऑफ देयर ओन दिस थिंग इंस्टेड ऑफ द पब्लिक इंटरेस्ट देन विल दैट बी कॉल्ड एज ए सिविल सोसाइटी ऑर्गेनाइजेशन और आउटसाइड द सिविल सोसाइटी सी इट इज बाय यू सी एज आई सेड ना यू सी इन सोशल साइंसेस इट इज फाइन ट्यूनिंग इज अ बिट डिफिकल्ट दे विल बी ट्रीटेड बाय पर्सनल एंड्स व्हाट आई मीन इज यू नो हियर इट मीन्स से मैटर्स से विच आर वेरी वेरी पर्सनल suppose say the medicos are agitating you know uh, for reasons which are highly personal uh, then i mean it is difficult to <laughs> no then if they are not part of the civil society then where do you place them so see it so is I I, uh, no no i will no. i will I, uh, no now i will be able to explain see you you take a medical college now you see you have students you take india you have students from different states and union territories now say uh, the students uh, get together and get uh, uh, to organize something uh, which say concerns they say caste or place of birth that's right then you know it is then not a civil society end no then uh, where do you place that type of activity okay. if it is not a uh, part of civil society and not See, a state, it is like not this. an activity belonging to uh, this i i will put it this way if you want me to break down for further uh, as a professional group <laughs> hmm. they would be treated as a part of civil society hmm. but the end that they would be pursuing would not be considered a civil society pursuit it would be a highly personal matter no uh, no personally i think one should uh, broaden the definition of civil society mm. to include all the groups yes the society will have some groups which uh, have I mean larger the interest some may have very narrow interest and some may have activities which are not really conducive to the uh, health of the society mm. but by the way just because they are performing activities which are not good for the state or society it doesn't mean they are not part of the civil society see so it should be a see, much broader uh, 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 i right now cannot give details attempts have been made to uh, widen the definition and meaning of civil society but as i said uh, generally you can use the terms interchangeably but you see the as space students and specialists uh, the you we can i can say that it is a self created problem yeah. we have created the problem well, perhaps uh, what uh, to, uh, uh, in order that uh, i mean it's a, then you i mean we get into academic uh, you know abstract talk <laughs> that you have to distinguish between concepts you know so no, the concepts are there uh, anurag i think uh, uh, what vijay is driving towards is uh, i think the perhaps the direction or the uh, or he is talking about a perfect civil society a perfect civil See, what, no, no, what i meant to say a, was a, a, you know no, no, i mean the, the there are there are there are debates in the civil society literature regarding See, i'll give an example mm -hmm. uh, which people may find it funny and i may be excused so but since we were say talking of medicos mm -hmm. now you see a a, a medico say whose wife has eloped now he cannot go and say ki this <laughs> is you know and and which we have to pursue because it is a totally private end right so it has to be a public cause a public and a purely this is what i meant you know yeah, yeah. if you want to find tune then by personal it means very personal okay. you can, you you have a quarrel with your you know say a medico and this is we i gave the example medicos see he he has his brother in law he has a quarrel with him now he ca this is not a civil society end right. it becomes a very personal end so that is how you can distinguish though as a professional group they are part of the civil society mm -hmm. but then the end which you are pursuing will not be con con considered a civil society end okay. that is how it is fine so we are <coughs> 
now placed uh, I mean I, I, I invite further questions I don't know how much time we have I have not yeah, been given I an indication almost reached the end Rajesh yeah, Arna, yeah. So, okay, uh, now uh, we have actually reached the end my uh, the, the staff in the EMPC tells me uh, we have had a very interesting discussion we started off by some kind of a delineation of various people who have talked about uh, civil society in the classical tradition uh, then we uh, went into the question of uh, the distinctions between civil society and community uh, which has also been made in the unit uh, in EPS 11 block 3. Uh, we also uh, got into a bit of a, an argument about uh, uh, the private ends and the narrow ends and the broader ends of civil society, what would they constitute? I mean, whether when narrow ends come into play, would that constitute a civil society or not? So on the whole, we have had a good discussion uh, with one input from uh, Karnal, two, when, inputs, uh, two inputs actually, two, in, uh, two inputs from Karnal. And uh, I expect uh, the Faculty of Political Science will f organize further discussions on this theme and we'll have further question and answer sessions and, uh, and hopefully uh, a more wider participative response. Thank you very much. Thank you.